I built this simple computer and wrote a program to print hello world on the screen. But the program's a bit of a mess right now. You know, it's over 150 lines of assembly language just to print hello world and see. Uh, printing character by character here, uh, you know, it's very repetitive because I just copy and pasted the code to print each character over and over again. And then if we go all the way back up to the top, I'm doing the same thing at the top here just to send the instructions to get the display module set up in the first place. So let's simplify this by moving this code here for sending a, a, an instruction into a subroutine that we could just call with a single line of code each time we need to. So I'm gonna copy all of this and paste it way down here at the bottom of the program. So this is all the way at the bottom. I'll paste that same code. And then I'll add a label here called LCD instruction, except I'll spell it right. And I'm calling it LCD instruction because this is the code that sends an instruction or whatever instructions in the A register to the LCD module. So back up at the top here, uh, here's, here we're sending some instructions and we're loading the instruction into the A register. And then instead of having all this code here, we can just say JSR, which is jump to subroutine LCD instruction. So this will load the instruction into the A register and then uh, jump down to the bottom here to this LCD instruction uh, section here and execute all this code here, which actually sends that instruction to the LCD. Then at the end of this, we can say RTS, which means return from subroutine, which will exit the subroutine and then jump back up wherever we came from. So if we go back to the top here, that'll jump up here to, uh, to where we just finished this, this jump subroutine instruction. And the nice thing is that we can reuse that subroutine for each of the instructions we need uh, to configure the LCD. So instead of doing all this, we get rid of that and say JSR LCD instruction. And then same thing here. This is another instruction, so we can get rid of all that and add another jump to subroutine LCD instruction. And so now it's uh, easier to follow this code because because here, you know, this is all the code to initialize the LCD module. And you can check out my last video where I go into what each of these instructions do and what each of these bits are for. But if you watch that video and know what these bits mean, then hopefully this code is pretty clear about what it's doing. And of course, you know, I've also got the comments over here, which should help, assuming they're correct. And then of course, we can do the same thing for actually printing the letters. So all of this code here prints the letter uh, H from the A register. So I can copy all that down into a subroutine down here at the bottom as well. And I can call that print character. And it's pretty similar to the subroutine for the LCD instruction. It's just we've got this register select uh, bit set here. But again, at the end, we need the return from subroutine instruction to exit the subroutine and go back up to the, the, the main program. And so now if we go back up here, we can replace all of this with just a jump subroutine print character. And I'll go ahead and do that for each letter in the entire message. And you can see this is going to significantly reduce the amount of code we need to, to send each letter since most of the code we started with was just repeating those same commands to send a letter to the display. And now that's been factored out into that subroutine. So now this is what we're left with and it's, you know, it's a lot shorter. And also I think a lot more clear about what it does. And the thing with assembly language is there's a direct correlation between the assembly code that you write and the machine code that runs. So let's save this. And if we look at the machine code we started with, you know, this is all the assembled machine code. And you can see there's a fair amount of it. Now let's run the assembler on our modified code. And now if we look at the new code that we generated, see, this is a, this is a lot shorter. So that means it's also gonna take up a lot less room in the ROM or, or wherever we're running it from. Now, there, I guess there is a trade-off in the sense that jumping to and returning from the subroutines will take a few extra clock cycles to execute. So technically this code will run slightly slower than what we had before. But you know, there's a huge improvement in size, so you know, I think that's a fine trade-off to make. So now I've got the EEPROM in the programmer, and this is just writing the new code to it. And it's done. So let's put the EEPROM back in the circuit, and it should work the same as before, because we haven't changed the functionality at all. We've just factored out that uh, repetitive functionality into, into those uh, subroutines. So I'll power this back up, and then I'll reset it here. It should work just the same as before, and we should see it print hello world on the screen, although it looks like maybe it's not working. I can try resetting it again. And yeah, it's not working. So what's going on here? Well, what we can do is, is step through the program and see and try to see what's going on. And in order to see exactly what's happening, I'll connect up a bunch of pins from this Arduino Mega that I've used in some of the previous videos. And so here I'll connect uh, 16 pins uh, from the Arduino to 16 address lines, which will let us use the Arduino to see exactly what value is on the address lines at all times. And then I'll connect another eight pins up to the eight data lines on the bus. So we can also see what data is on the bus at, at any point in time. And then I'll hook up uh, one more uh, signal here to the read write pin to see whether the processor is reading from or writing to the bus. 
And then finally, I'll hook up a signal to the clock pin because you know I've got the Arduino program to read all these other pins just at that moment when the clock uh, signal pulses so we can follow each clock cycle. And then of course, we'll need a common ground connection between the computer and the Arduino. So let's plug the Arduino in and then power up the computer. And this is the same Arduino code from the first video in this series if you wanna know more about how it, how it works. Uh, but if I uh, pop open the serial monitor here, we can see, yeah, there it goes. So it's, it's definitely doing something. And this first column here tells us what address the address lines are on. So this is the first 16 wires that I hooked up there that shows us the address bus. Uh, the next uh, eight bits here, the second column shows us the data bus. And then we've got the address bus here just in hexadecimal. And then over on the right, this is the data, uh, data bus in, in hexadecimal. And then this column here is either R or W to show whether the processor is reading or writing to the data bus. So let's hold down reset now and then just stop the clock. And then I can uh, clear the output here. And then it takes uh, seven clock cycles for the processor to initialize. So I'll step through seven clock cycles. And incidentally, when I made this circuit to do the single stepping, I think I may have made the pulse width a little bit too short. So it still does sometimes bounce when you uh, let go of the switch. A quick hacky workaround is just to put a 0.1 microfarad capacitor right across the switch, which I did here, and that, that seems to help things a little bit. But in any event, after that initialization, uh, it then reads the reset vector and gets uh, 8000. So it's going to jump to address 8000, which is the start of our program. And if you didn't follow all this, you know, that's, that's fine. I cover all this in the first few videos if you want to go back and watch that. But, but at any rate, at this point, we're at address 8000 and we're reading uh, A9, which is the first load A instruction because, you know, A9 is the opcode for load A. So if you keep going here, we get load A, FF, and then 8D is store A. And so that's uh, store A6002. And that's this uh, store A DDRB. And so then on the next clock cycle, we see it writing that FF to address 6002. And if we keep going, we get load A E0 and then store A 6003. So that's the store A DDRA. And now we can see it writing that E0 to address 6003. The next we get load A 38. And that's our, our first instruction that we want to send to the LCD. So, so far, so good. And now we're reading uh, 20. And that should be the, the jump to subroutine. And, and you know, if we look at the data sheet, that, that is indeed correct. Two zero is, is the opcode for jump to subroutine. Okay, so then next we expect it to read the address to, to jump. So it's reading 5D and then 5D again, but this is, this is sort of interesting. So for some reason, it's now at address 0124 and it's reading and it's, I don't know what, where it's getting this 5D from. But after this jump to subroutine, I would expect it to, to, to read two bytes. I would expect it to read a byte from 800D and 800E because that's where the address to, to jump to is. But instead, it's going to this 0124, um, which, which is sort of weird. So, so let's keep going. So wait a minute. Now what's it doing? So now it's, it's still at that address 0124, but now it's writing and it's writing 80. And then if we go one more clock cycle, now we see it's you know, at address 0123 and it's writing zero E. So, so what's up with this? You know, we had this jump subroutine instruction and then it, it seems to have read half of the address to jump to, but then it's going into the, there's these other addresses and it's, you know, looks like it's writing something to those addresses. So, so what's up with that? Well, let's, let's actually keep going a couple more steps. So now if I go one more step, it actually seems like it's maybe back on track here, right? Because we had 800C, it's reading the opcode for the jump to subroutine. Then 800D, it's reading 5D, and then 800E, eventually, after all this weirdness, it's reading 80. And that part seems right, because we have a jump subroutine, and then if you look at this 5D and this 80, that's the address it's jumping to, and those are the next two bytes after the instruction. So, so that sort of makes sense, jump subroutine to 805D, that sounds right. And in fact, if we go one more step here, we end up at address 805D, which is which is the, actually the beginning of our subroutine. So this, this is doing the right thing, but it's doing something else kind of weird here with this address 0124, and it's writing some data there. So what's going on with that? And what it's doing here, particularly these two clock cycles here, is, is actually really important, you know, because we're jumping to a subroutine. And the way we expect this to work, if I, if I go back to the code here, um, you know, we are at this point here. So we, we're doing this jump subroutine to LCD instruction. And LCD instruction, apparently the address for that is this um, 805D. And we are eventually reading that, right? So we're reading the, the jump subroutine instruction. So that's the jump subroutine here. 
And then the, uh, the label or the address to jump to is LCD instruction. And it's gonna read that, you know, the instruction was at 800C, so it's gonna read 800D and then eventually 800E to get that address 805D, and then it jumps to 805D. And then 805D is LCD instruction. So that's all the way down here. So this uh, LCD instruction, the first instruction there should be store A. And so if we look here, 805D, we're reading an 8D, and 8D is in fact the opcode for a store A. But you know what's going on here? What's going on here in the middle? What is this writing? What is this 0124, 0123? Uh, what, what is all that nonsense? Well, what's going on is once we get down to this LCD instruction, we've jumped down here, we're gonna start executing all this stuff, and then eventually we're gonna to get to this return from subroutine, and we're gonna to need to somehow find our way back up to where we started um, up here when we called that subroutine so that we can continue executing our program. And so what address does it need to jump back to? That's the, that's the question, because the, the return from subroutine doesn't, you know, doesn't give an address, it just says return from wherever you came from. So the processor actually has to keep track of where we came from, and that's what it's doing with these extra clock cycles here. And specifically what it's doing is it's writing, uh, it's writing this, this 800E, which is the return address that we're, we're going to have to return to. Because this 800E is actually the last address that we, that we, that we came from. So, so what really what the processor is doing is it's taking a couple extra clock cycles here to save that address so that we can return back to it. Um, and so it's, it's, it's writing this 800E somewhere in memory so that we can get back to it. So let's keep stepping through the code here. So at this point, we're in the subroutines. We read a store A uh, 6000, which is port B, and we see it write the instructions to address 6000. We have a load A0 and a store A uh, 6001, which is port A, and there's the zero being written to 6001. And we have load A80, which is the enable bit, and a store A to 6001 again to set the enable bit. And there it goes. We see the top bit here getting set to at address 6001. Then a load A0 again, and another uh, store A6001. And there we see the zero going out to 6001 again, clearing that enable bit. And that's the whole sort of dance we need to go through to send an instruction to the LCD, like I talked about in the last video. And so that all seemed to work just fine. And so here we are at the, the next address, you know, 806F, where we're reading 60 hex. And 60 is the instruction for return from subroutine. So what do we expect this to do? Well, it should jump back to that return address that we saved up here, this uh, 800E. So we'd actually expect it to jump to 800F, which would be the next instruction to execute after the, the subroutine. So it should somehow uh, jump back to this 800E. So let's keep stepping forward and see what it does. So if we step forward, um, it actually doesn't seem to do anything. It just kind of advances to the next, uh, you know, after 6F, it goes to 70, which is just the next uh, memory location. And it's reading, you know, this 8D, which I guess is whatever instruction is there. I don't think it's actually reading this to execute that instruction. I think the processor is actually just taking a couple extra clock cycles here, you know, to, to do some internal stuff. So I don't think that just because we see this on the bus that it's it's actually going to try to execute that. And if we keep going, we see now it, it actually is is reading from address 0122. In the next clock cycle, it reads from uh, 0123 uh, and then 0124. And if you remember that 01230124, that's where this return address was saved. So up here, uh, when we actually jumped into the subroutine, the processor uh, saved that return address at address 0124 and 0123. So I saved that 800E. And so now down here, it seems like it's, it's trying to get that return address back so that it can return, which makes a ton of sense. But we've got a problem. And the problem is that it's not reading that same address back that it saved up here. So it saved uh, this 800E by writing it to those two addresses. But down here, when it when it reads from those addresses, it's it's just reading this 8D. And, and this is our problem. This is why our program doesn't work. And the problem is that we actually don't have any hardware that responds to address 0123 or 0124. There's nothing at this address. So when the processor writes to address 0124 or 0123 up here, it's not actually writing to anything. It's just sort of throwing it out on the bus, but nothing, there's no hardware responding to it. There's no, uh, no, there's no memory. There's nothing that's, that's doing anything with that. And so then when it tries to read it back down here, it's not actually reading from anything. It's just getting whatever happens to be on the bus. And that's why our program doesn't work. You know, the, pro the processor is trying to save the return address, but our computer doesn't actually have any RAM in it yet. So, so it doesn't work. And so it gets this far, but when it tries to return from the subroutine with this return, the uh, you know, six zero instruction, it tries to read the return address and it gets this 8D8D. And if we step once more, you can see it jumps to 8D8D. 
So it thinks it's jumping back to where it, where it should, but it's it's not. It's jumping to some other just sort of arbitrary address. Is definitely not going to be our program anymore. And so if we keep going, it's just going to do all kinds of other weird, weird and wild things. But none of this is anything that we want. So one question you might be wondering is why is it trying to write the return address to 0124 and 0123? You know, where did 0124 come from? Where did 0123 come from? Where did, where did these addresses come from? Well, in the data sheet for the processor, it says the stack may use memory from uh, 0100 through 01FF. And this is something that's just hard coded into the way that the 6502 microprocessor works is these particular addresses are reserved for this thing called the stack. And the way the stack works is you've got these 256 addresses from 0100 through 01FF in memory. And then you've also got a processor register uh, called the stack pointer that is pointing to one of these addresses. So this is actually gonna be an 8-bit pointer. Um, but if it has the value of 24, for example, then it would be pointing to this address 0124 because you know all of the stack is, is gonna be 01 something. So if the stack pointer is, is 24, then it's gonna be pointing to 0124 in memory. And then when we do that jump to subroutine, it pushes the return address onto the stack. So we're gonna put the return address of uh, 80, uh, zero E onto the stack, that's a zero. But then also each time it pushes a value onto the stack, it decrements the stack pointer. So now our stack pointer is pointing up there. That way if we're inside one subroutine and we wanna call another subroutine, we can you know push another return address onto the stack and kind of keep going um, and keep calling all sorts of subroutines. We can even push our own data onto the stack, you know, as long as we're careful to pull it off the stack uh, in the opposite order that we push it on. Uh, the stack can actually be a really handy place to temporarily store data. So for example, with our subroutine here to uh, send an instruction to the LCD, um, the subroutine starts by, we actually load something into the A register and then call the subroutine. And then if we look in the subroutine, you know, it's gonna use what's in the A register, whoops, this one here, um, but it's also gonna overwrite what's in the A register in order to toggle the enable bit here. So something to be aware of is that up here, where we call this uh, subroutine, we're loading something in the A register and then we're calling the subroutine. Well, when that subroutine is done executing, this value is not gonna be in the A register anymore because the subroutine modifies it. And in our case, that's fine. You know, We're putting something else in the A register right away anyway, so it doesn't, doesn't really matter. But if we wanted to, down here in the subroutine, what we could do is push the value in the A register onto the stack. And then what that would do is it would put that value, I think it was 3.8 or something, whatever that value was, it would put that on the stack and then move the, and then decrement the stack pointer again. And so we have this extra value for what our A register was when, the, when we called that subroutine. But then of course we have to be very careful that before we return from the subroutine, we need to pull that value off the stack and put it back into the A register. And so what this pull A will do is after we've used the A register to toggle the enable flag here, it'll pull a value off the stack which in this case is gonna be this 38, it's gonna pull that off the stack and it's gonna increment the stack pointer. And then that 38 will get put back into the A register here. So by pushing the A register onto the stack at the beginning of the subroutine and pulling it off the stack at the end of the subroutine, that means that when we call the subroutine up here, um, when, we, when we do this jump to subroutine, when we get to the next statement here in our, in our program, the A register will have the same thing that it had before we called the subroutine if we cared about that. You know, in our case, we don't actually really care about that. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete both of these lines because they do add a couple extra clock cycles to the, the program. And you know, there's just no need. Now, if we push A onto the stack and don't pull it off before the return here, that would be bad because instead of returning to the, the correct address, you know, 800E, if the stack pointer is off, you know, because we didn't pull that top value off the stack, then the return instruction would think we need to return to you know, 0E38. So we'd, we'd end up jumping to some other random memory address, you know, the 03, E38 or whatever. And, and of course that wouldn't be good because you know, who knows what's at that address. So we always have to be careful about not pushing stuff onto the stack that we don't uh, pull off later in the, in the reverse order. We also have to be careful because on the 6502, like I said, the stack is always starts at you know, address 0100 and goes through 01FF. So it's just 256 bytes. So if we end up, you know, pushing more than 256 bytes onto the stack, you know, if we're calling more functions. So, you know, we call this function, maybe we push this value on the stack and maybe within this function, we call another function. And so we have to, you know, push another address onto the stack. Um, and maybe that function calls another function. Uh, you know, if we, if we got convoluted enough or maybe we had some recursion or something, we could get in a situation where, you know, we keep pushing more and more stuff onto the stack. And then of course we get up to 0100. And then if we were to decrement the stack pointer, it would just wrap around to FF. 
And so we'd end up down here at 01FF, and we could keep pushing stuff onto the stack. Um, and, and all of this would be fine up until the point where the stack pointer wraps around, and we're about to push something onto the stack that overwrites stuff that we already had on the stack. And if that happens, that's not good. That's what we call a stack overflow. Because here, you know, if we ended up pushing something else onto the stack, maybe there's another function call, you know, we've gone, gone down the rabbit hole here, and we have another function call, we push that return address onto the stack, it would overwrite this return address. And everything would seem to be working fine because we would return from that function and we would, you know, return from the right address and we'd return from whatever called it and we'd pull off whatever else we had on the stack and it would just kind of keep wrapping around until we got to FF and then when it incremented, when we pulled something else off the stack, it would uh, wrap back around to uh, zero, zero and we could keep pulling stuff off the stack. All of this would work fine until we get to this point where we've overwritten stuff from that very first function call. And so when we return from that very first function call, we wouldn't have the correct return address here, and uh, that would be bad. And you know who knows what would happen. So we definitely want to be careful to avoid a stack overflow situation like this because they can be very difficult to uh, to troubleshoot. Now you might also be wondering, you know, we've got this stack that goes from zero one zero zero through zero one ff. You know why do we start pushing data at zero one two four? You know where? You know why would the stack pointer start here and, and not you know anywhere else? Well, it's because the stack pointer just happened to start out at 2.4. It just happened to be initialized with that value. It's, you know, it's just completely arbitrary when the CPU powers on what value is going to be in that stack pointer. So maybe a good thing to do would be at the beginning of our program or you know, right when the CPU powers up and initializes, you know, to initialize the stack pointer to FF here. So it always starts out at the top of the address range. And then the nice thing about that is that as we push values onto the stack, you know, we can always look at the stack pointer and know like, oh, if it's pointing to, you know, if the stack pointer is 2.6, it's pointing here, then that means that we would have, you know, 20, or not 26, but uh, 26 hex, however, however many bytes that is, we would know how many bytes we have left in our stack. Whereas if it's down here at, you know, FD, we'd know uh, we have, you know, 254 bytes available above that in our stack. So how would we go about putting FF into the stack pointer to initialize it like that? Well, if we look at our instructions, you know, there's a load A instruction, there's a load X instruction, there's a load Y instruction. But unfortunately, there's no load stack or load stack pointer instruction. However, there is, if we flip over here, there are some uh, transfer instructions uh, that work with the stack pointer. So for example, we have uh, transfer, where is it? Transfer X, transfer X to stack. And this will let us put a value in the stack pointer from the X register, which we can load. So basically this has to be a two-step operation. You know, first we can load X with FF and then transfer x to s, and this will end up initializing the stack pointer to ff because we're you know, loading that into x and then we're transferring that to the, the stack pointer. And that'll initialize the stack pointer to ff, meaning the stack pointer now starts at the end here, and then as data gets pushed onto the stack, the stack pointer moves up like this. Although, uh, usually you'd say the stack uh, grows downward because the, the numbers are actually getting smaller. Uh, so you know, maybe I drew this upside down, but you, you get the idea. But anyway, you know, the reason our program isn't working is because it's trying to use this stack, uh, but our computer doesn't actually have any RAM in it at address, you know, 0123, 0124, or, you know, 01FF or, or anywhere. And that's what I plan to fix in the next video. I'll add some memory to the computer by wiring up this RAM chip. And, you know, right now, of course, we have the ROM, which is read-only memory, and that's where our program is stored. Uh, but so far, we haven't added any RAM that we can read from uh, and also write to. And so that's what we need to do. So in the next video, I'll, I'll add the RAM and make sure part of it is accessible at the, those address, you know, 0100 through 01FF. And then our computer will have uh, memory we can write to, which means it'll have a stack, uh, which means that subroutine calls will work. In the meantime, you can check out my website at eater.net slash 6502 for more information, schematics, uh, and kits, which include all the parts that I've uh, used in these videos in case you're interested in following along yourself. And as always, thanks to all my patrons for your support. Your contributions on Patreon really help me continue making this content, so thank you.